right. Hi, uh, welcome everyone uh, from the Magnets team. Um, the format is usually is 25 to 30 minute presentation where we recommend to keep your microphone muted. Uh, if 10 to 15 minutes will follow with time for questions from the audience. If you don't want, if you don't want to uh, type, if you don't want to speak, you can type in uh, the questions in the chat and I can read it out loud for you. And there is time for a catch up uh, at the end if interested, but it's not recorded. So for today, I'm really happy to introduce you Hannah Rudd from uh, Grenoble, University of Grenoble, presenting um, about core surface flow inversion ingredients, understanding the effects of geodynamo prior to magnetic models uh, data. So please, uh, mm, please take the uh, floor, Hannah, and uh, thanks a lot for accepting our invitation. <laughs> so many things to organize. Um, so hello, um, thanks for that great introduction, Anita. So um, this is uh, my presentation, um, and I'm going to be presenting some work that I've been doing at uh, Easter at University Grenoble Alps um, as part of the ERC Graceful project. Uh, and can I hide this? Um, this work has been undertaken with Nicolas Gillet, um, with Julien Aubert and Miara Mandea. And um, I'm going to just be introducing some motivation behind this work before kind of talking about the data inputs and methodology that I've been using uh, before coming on to some results and conclusions. Um, so the general setup for the talk is as you would expect. And what I really want to stress here is that the motivation behind of this, all of this work, is that we want to study the motion of liquid iron at the top of the Earth's outer core. And in particular, we want to know which features are robust, whether we can see uh, into annual motions, what are the long-term trends of core flow models. And the way that we do this is by using a PyGDN inversion. So this is a Python package that's freely available, uh, developed by the team at Easter. And there's two main parts that go into that inversion process. So there's the magnetic field inputs, which is the main field, the secular variation, and a degree, uh, a spherical harmonic degree model that limits the secular variation. And there's also some dynamo prior inputs. So we have our main field and secular variation that is generated by our dynamo, our core flow motion that we use, uh, get extract from the dynamo, um, and errors of representativeness. So this is the summation of the effect of diffusion and subgrids, so small length scales that we can't necessarily see from our secular variation models, which we measure at the surface. And one of the big questions that I was hoping to answer was, what is the relative importance of each of these inputs? So how much does the field model affect our pi gdn inversion? How much does the uh, geodynamo prior affect our uh, inversion as well. I just wanted to mention um, the spherical harmonic degree L of secular variation quickly because our main field is uh, changing at a much quicker rate than our crustal field. So maybe by pushing our secular variation harmonic degree up to degree 16 or 18, we could be gaining some more information while constricting our main field model to degree 13. So this is what I'm referring to when I say LSV. So the spherical harmonic degree of our secular variation model. And again, the whole point of this are what features are robust? What can we uh, find out about core surface flow from our models? So um, our pygeodine core flow inversion take, is a time dependent stochastic core flow inversion model with a Kalman filter. So if we have our true magnetic field that is varying with time, and we have our observation points of the magnetic field, we can use a ensemble of stochastic field forecasts based off the spatio-temporal knowledge from dynamo simulations. And we forecast for multiple time steps. And then at a evenly spaced observation point, we conduct an analysis of the ensemble of models and we compare it to the observation from our field model. And 
This is really good because it gives us some statistics of uncertainty and the different ways that the flow might diverge uh, depending on our ge uh, geodynamo prior statistics. And so to kind of re represent that mathematically, um, the temporal evolution of the radial magnetic field is described as the radial part of the induction equation at the core mantle boundary. And here it is restricted for large length scales and with our spherical harmonic representation. And our data simulation steps require the spatial cross covariance that are derived from the priors where the star is the sample series of the spectral coefficients and zero is the background quantities. So here we have it for the main field, the flow and the errors of representativeness. Um, so when we do our forecasting steps, we use a AR1 process to uh, forecast the uh, flow and errors of representativeness, this ER term. And we do this by splitting it into a background flow and a deviating flow. So this last term involves a Gaussian noise term, which is uncorrelated in time and related to the cross covariances to match the prior samples. So that's what I showed you on the last slide. And this middle term involves this drift matrix. Now in this uh, setup of Pygeodine, we're using a diagonal drift matrix. And one of the things that I really wanted to stress here that is that we can't currently construct a more complex drift matrix for all of the priors that I'm going to be using. But if we had uh, geodynamo priors run to lower Ekman numbers, then we can construct more complex drifts and we can start to say something about the different uh, interplays between individual snapshots. Um, so more geophysical meaningful uh, statistics can be extracted if we had better uh, availability to geodynamo priors. And this is really like one of the emphases of um, the fair mod community that was set up at IUTG and I think is going to be discussed further at ADU next week. So the complete forecast is therefore kind of defined by these four equations and we are completely dependent on geodynamo prior information when we complete our forecasting steps. When we move on to the analysis steps, as well as the ensemble of forecast states that we have um, and the geodynamo statistics, we also include our main field and secular variation observations. And our analysis is performed in two steps. So we have a, a best linear unbiased estimate of firstly the main field B um, using the main field observation and an ensemble of forecasts. And then we have the same best linear unbiased estimate of the ensemble of realizations, but this time doing it on the uh, flow U and the errors of representativeness ER. And again, this is represented by these three equations here. And this K matrix is the common gain matrix, which uh, with a G lasso algorithm containing the correlation uh, of the forecasted state and the observation. So again, just really emphasizing that here we're using a mix of geodynamo statistics and observations from our field models. What are the relative importance of these when we then look at our flow models in the output? So I mentioned already that we're going to be uh, looking at flow models. So here we have our three flow models that we're considering. So we have our chaos model, our CalMag model, and our COBOPS model. And these are taken from the January 2015 snapshot. And these are three candidate models for IGRF and some other models. And they are all constructed slightly differently. And I have put the references there if you want to go away and have a look at them. But in general, we see a very good fit, especially over um, satellite period from 2000 to today. And um, these are well-maintained models and you can extract these uh, field models online should you wish to go away and use them yourself. So Chaos 7 is only limited to the satellite era. So from 2000, just before 2000 to present, um, but CAMAG and COBOBS are longer term models 
but due to its construction, COBOBS is limited to LSB 14. So we're not going to be able to do those um, higher secular variation degrees uh, investigations with COBOBS. And then in terms of our dynamo priors, we're actually looking at five dynamo priors and we've split them into two families. So the first family is the along path dynamo uh, generated by Julian Albert at IPTP. And all of these use an anisotropic, anisotropic forcing to produce westward drift by a gravitational coupling between the inner core and density anomalies in the mantle. And we've got three steps along this path. So the standard model, the mid path model, and the 71% path model. And uh, the path can be found in this 2017 reference in more detail. So this standard model, um, Julian has kindly let us uh, present uh, today, um, along with his stratified model. And the main difference from his previously published work is it's a bit like the coupled earth dynamo, but the eccentric gyre isn't fixed and therefore has the ability to move as the mid pass and 71% path can. When we look at the across path family, they are in a similar Ekman range to this standard dynamo, but with alterations to the forcing. So we're expecting them to be within the same kind of Earth-like regime, but with different dynamics due to these um, adaptations. So the stratified uh, model is from Julian Aubert again, but with a 140 kilometer thick stratified layer at the top, and it's got a density anomaly about 10 times the typical density that drives the convection. And our second model is the S1 dagger, um, as first described in Schweiger et al. 2023. And it's the same si simulation as, as S1, but set up in stressfully boundary conditions with a larger electric conductivity. And the most important thing kind of to note with this final one is that it's an isotropic forcing. So it's uh, equal forcing around the sphere. And before we even plug this into Pygeodine, we can start to look at the dynamo statistics to give some indication about how we expect these different dynamos to behave. And immediately I was drawn to the fact that S1 in purple here um, has much lower degree one spherical harmonic power for its flow, but much higher degree two and degree three. And it's generally one of the highest powers uh, as you, at large length scales as well. And we can also look at the variance and we can see that in general, uh, stratification has limited the power in um, the largest length scales, um, but increased the energy in the smallest length scales, which is also quite interesting. So we're already gaining some information and we can then go on and start to look at individual coefficients. So this is a probability density uh, distribution. And what we're trying to show is um, the mean of each of these coefficients is represented by a point. And then we've got a, a first and second standard deviation um, marked around it in the solid and then the dashed lines. Um, on the left, we have our, our one zero coefficients on the x-axis and our three zero coefficients on the y-axis. And on the right here, we have our cosine two one coefficients on the x-axis and our sine two one coefficients on the y-axis. And all of these are for the toroidal coefficients. Um, so the colors are gonna stay consistent through the presentation. So um, along this top, we've got our along path and across the bottom, we've got our across path. And if we start at the top here, we can see that moving along the path has increased the spread of the TC1 and the TC30 coefficients. So these distributions are actually wider spread. But the mid path and the 71% path are actually very similar. And, um, it's just extremely interesting to see kind of like how that narrowing is happening. It's also interesting to see that stratification has narrowed our probability density function for our coefficients compared to our standard 
uh, model. And the S1 coefficients are completely offset from in our TC1, TC30 uh, coefficients. The spread for TC21 is slightly offset and is generally wider than the standard model as well, which again, this is all just information that will go into our statistics. So this will be used in our forecasting and in our analysis. So now for our results. So we're using this PyGD methodology and we're using it to produce snapshots of the flow at particular times. So we've chosen 2017, 1916, 1920 as uh, references. We are also going to look at length of day. So we're looking at the 1900 to 2020 and we're comparing it to a cleaned reference that's available on the PyGD website. Um, the flow trend over the satellite era and then also into annual wave like dynamics. So results from the snapshot. So this is our CalMag reference. So this is a degree 13 CalMag standard prior. And then for these figures on the left, we're going to take our reference and we're going to look at the difference between our reference and our prior that we're interested in. And along the top here, we've got the difference moving along the dynamo path, so the mid path and 71% path. And on the bottom, we've got moving across the path, so the stratified prior and then the S1 prior. And immediately we can see that this S1 prior is behaving very differently from the rest of the um, dynamos. And that's not really surprising due to the isotropic forcing um, associated with it. But it is interesting to see that this whole flow map is in much weaker in the um, east-west direction. Uh, so this is U5 in the color scale and the absolute uh, flow speed in the points. So this uh, flow speed is in general much, much weaker. I also think it's interesting that we've uh, managed to focus a lot of our variation to this equatorial band and also around and just outside the um, equator, uh, the tangent cylinder, sorry, so the point where the inner core projected up to the core mantle boundary. Um, but at mid-latitudes, we see less difference. So we're really seeing the effect of moving towards a, in theory, more Earth-like um, geodynamo prior. In terms of stratification, uh, these are very small scale and um, global uh, changes that we're seeing to our flow model. And we need to do some, yeah, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. But again, there's some interesting things that we can pick out, such as uh, looking at these uh, high flux patches and other things. So in terms of spectra, um, the secular variation. So this is, if we have the flow, what kind of secular variation does it generate? And the good news is that the secular variation and the errors of representativeness are extremely similar when we're changing the prior. And that is good because we're always fitting the same data. So we would expect, or we would hope for a good fit. And there's not really a noticeable pattern when we're changing the prior. And this is all good news, um, but it's more interesting when we start to look at the flow spectra. So our flow spectra is showing more difference, and the S1 is showing the most difference at large, large length scales. And we're also seeing that um, at the smallest length scales, across the path shows a larger difference than along the path. So we are seeing a difference when we're moving along the path, but um, in general, moving across the path is having a much bigger effect. And I'm going to come back to this in a second after we talk about field models. So here we have our reference, the same reference as before. And this time along the top, we are increasing our secular variation degree. So changing our field model. So this is the chaos field model, and this is the Cobbs field model. And immediately, I hope you can see that changing the field model has a very, very small effect on the flow generated. There is almost no absolute flow change. I mean, there is a little bit um, down here by Madagascar, but it's very small compared to 
changing the LSB. Um, increasing the LSB seems to increase the small length scales. Um, and again, this is mostly concentrated, uh, well, I guess contrary, um, we're not necessarily seeing that focus so much at the equator and instead we're seeing it in this mid latitude and uh, this area. So again, that's quite interesting uh, moving forward, whether we can potentially glean some more information from using a higher secular variation degree. Um, in terms of our secular variation, our plots are very similar, but we are seeing a offset with our field model in the difference of secular variation spectra. And the reason for this is because the data we are fitting is now different. And so this is not surprising, but it is good to see that in general, our field models are all agreeing up to degree 13 and uh, there's very little difference between our field models and we're doing a good job of fitting them. Increasing the LSV is uh, potentially increasing the information here, but who knows. When we look at the flow model, we can increase, um, we think that the increasing the LSV is increasing the energy in the flow at the smallest length scales. So potentially we are uh, gaining some information. This doesn't necessarily seem to be the case at the largest length scales, and it is very much the smallest length scales um, that we're gaining information. But the jump between um, degree 13 and degree 16 and degree 18 doesn't seem to be a linear jump. Um, there doesn't seem to be a obvious correlation. Um, so I think that also needs uh, some further work to look into. The choice of flow model shows a very small difference. So this is a factor of 10 smaller than the choice of prior. So changing the field model is having a very, very small effect on our flow. And here we uh, sum this up by looking at the kinetic energy as a percentage uh, compared to the reference. And this is a lot of numbers in the table, so I'm gonna try and break it down as quickly and simply as possible. but really just to show you, we've had a really uh, thorough, robust check of all of these, um, that changing our field model has an incredibly small influence on our energy model. So um, a 1% difference between COVOBs and CAMAG is almost the same flow model. When we look at changing the secular variation degree, we're seeing actually a massive increase in uh, kinetic energy change. And 10% uh, is, uh, essentially we could be adding more information into our flows by including a larger secular variation degree, but that depends on the quality of your data that's at um, higher degrees. So is we need to consider that whenever we do our flow models. Then when we look along the uh, path, we can see that moving along the path, you're getting increasing kinetic energy difference, which is expected because we're moving further away from our reference. And again, if we're moving towards a more Earth-like model, then maybe we're gaining information by uh, moving to higher percentage along the path. And then moving across the path, we are seeing the biggest difference. So especially with the S1 prior, we're seeing the biggest difference of all, but even the difference between stratification and moving to the mid path, that's a massive difference. So um, again, we're just trying to find ways to quantify how our models are affected by these different coefficients, with these different inputs. And we've repeated this in the past. So this is um, our flow maps from 1960. And these paint a very, very similar idea to what I've just shown you. And again, we can go back in time again to 1920. And hopefully what you're seeing is your colors are intensifying, the amount of variation is intensifying. Um, so what we're showing is that when you go back in time, in general, these percentages, um, the percentage difference between these plots gets bigger. 
and um, that is also something to do. And we have summed this all up in this um, rather horrendous looking table, which um, again, I'm hopefully going to simplify by talking through the main points. So when I showed you 2017, I said the field models are very similar in the satellite era. When we go back in time, the larger kinetic energy difference, you see a larger kinetic energy difference uh, with increasing time from the present due to more variation between the field models. So what I'm saying here is that 13.38 compared to 1%. And this is due to the quality of the data in the field model. Increasing LSV doesn't appear to have a large effect on core surface flow over the satellite era. Um, sorry, it does have a large effect over the satellite era, but it seems to have a very small effect over the pre-satellite era. And that might be due to uh, the data quality for spherical harmonic degrees above 13. If we look at moving across the path as opposed to along the path, move it, Moving across the path always has a greater impact on the core flow compared to moving along the path, but this effect lessens with time, and the S1 dagger prior always sits apart from our other solutions. And our, the effect of changing our field model becomes a greater input than choice of prior in the pre-satellite era. So this is really um, highlighting the need for continued good coverage of uh, data um, and good field models moving forward. So in terms of length of day, um, this is some very recent results um, and there are definitely things that we need to investigate more here. So changing the prior shifts, um, the variation of the length of day um, and changing that we, we can potentially shift this length of day line or these models to fit our length of day. Um, and this needs some more work in the future. But it's very encouraging that all of our plots have a very similar shape, and it seems to be the magnitude of the y-axis that is changing with our effect of the prior. The effect of changing the LSD is very small, as shown by this green dotted line. And changing the magnetic model is very similar from 1970 onwards. So uh, COBOBS, CalMag, and CHAOS uh, tend to overlie each other, particularly in the satellite era. And the S1 has the most similar fit uh, in the pre-satellite era, um, but this again might be due to, we need to do some more investigations about maybe shifting our models relative to the length of day um, at start point. If we look at individual coefficients, it's very obvious that this S1 is sitting well above our other models. Um, especially for the TC10 and the TC21, and, and this later half, the TC30 as well. Again, changing the LSB has a very small effect, and changing our field model um, has a very different effect from changing the priors. So, what I mean by this is that in the earlier times where our field models are less well constrained, there seems to be a biggest difference compared to, um, but over the satellite era, these uh, coefficients agree quite well. So it seems to be the case that data quality is really affecting how well our flow models can fit uh, or how well our flow models can agree. So what we're seeing before 2000 has a very different uh, nature compared to after 2000 when we have uh, continuous data coverage. And the reason that these are shifted off is probably due to the Dynamo statistics that were going into these uh, Dynamos in the first place. But again, these are quite recent results and we're still looking into these and um, hoping to find a slightly more uh, concrete explanation. When we look at the flow trend over the entire satellite era, um, hopefully we can see that all of these plots look quite similar. So here we are changing the secular variation degree. Here we are changing the flow model we're considering. And on the right here, we're changing the prior. And actually, 
all of these models uh, show um, eastward flow growing in the Pacific around 2013. We see um, the same types of structure, um, but you can maybe start to see a little bit more information spatially here by uh, increasing the spherical harmonic degree or using the S1 prior. Um, and moving along the path has also increased uh, the intensity of our flow structures and also um, maybe the spatial resolution as well. We can also band pass this to look at uh, interannual wave features. So this is the seven year, uh, this is band passed around the seven year wave, um, wave features that have been suggested by Hule and others. And it's really encouraging to see that regardless of the dynamo prior, regardless of the field model, regardless of the LSV, these are robust patterns and these wave dynamics seem to be um, there regardless of what inputs you place into your uh, pygeodine uh, inversion. And again, we can start to look into these slightly more about whether we can see more structures within certain field models and priors. Um, but again, we're just starting to really investigate this and um, we think this is a really exciting uh, avenue to be working on. So in terms of our conclusions, um, the effect of chain field models are very similar over the satellite era, but with our increasing uh, difference due to the increasing uh, decreasing data quality in time. Uh, we're starting to see more variation when we go back in time. Uh, increasing our secular variation degree does not appear to have a large effect. Um, sorry. Increasing LSV does appear to have a... Sorry, I've written that statement wrong. LSV does appear to affect the core surface flow over the satellite era, but less so in the pre-satellite era. And again, this is probably related to the data quality of our field models. Uh, moving across the path with the geodynamo prior has a larger impact than moving along the path. But when you go back further in time, the field model plays a greater effect. And um, we've identified a number of features of flow that seem really robust regardless of the prior or field model or LSE that um, go into it. But again, we're starting to look at these variations in a bit more detail, and this is very much ongoing work. So um, in terms of future directions, currently we've only run 1900 to 2000 uh, with five-year time steps, um, well, five-year analysis time steps. So we need to rerun some of our inversions with denser time steps. And again, I mentioned this, we want to investigate length of day um, in further detail. And again, I mentioned this briefly, but we're only using the diagonal drift for our core flow um, inversion. And there is a, a copy of Pygeodine which uses um, a dense AR1 methodology um, but that requires having access to dynamos which are run for, with a low enough number for a long enough time and are having access to those uh, an ensemble of statistics. So um, I guess I'm really encouraged by the creation of the FairMod community and like some other initiatives to kind of encourage uh, data sharing. And I'm really excited to see where that goes and hopefully plug in more field models and dynamo models into this uh, inversion re regime um, in the future. So thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Hannah. Big round of applause for everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now there is time for questions. If you want to ask a question, you can uh, Raise your hand or you can unmute yourself and, and ask the question. Or you can type the chat if you want at this time. Uh, Frederick, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks, Hannah, for a good talk. Um, it was quite cool to see all the comparisons between 
secular version um, degree and all the different models. I'm quite interested to see what the different priors affect Paiju then. Um, what I was going to ask is, can I confirm how you calculate length of day from flow? Could you maybe elaborate on that? Uh, yes. Um, so I can send you the exact equation in the treaties of geophysics if you so want it. Um, but it's you take your flow coefficients um, from, I think it's one, it's mostly one, zero, three, zero, and uh, there's another one. Um, and you can basically scale them. And it's been calculated by Chris and Dominique. Chris Finley and Dominique help. So um, yeah, there's yeah. a mathematical thing you can extract straight from your flow coefficients. I just want to confirm that that was the one and it wasn't a uh, secret dynamo magic that was going to throw it up. Uh, no, it's core flow stuff. <laughs> because... <laughs> okay, thanks uh, for your question, Frederick. That's what magnet stays for magic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if anybody has a question, has a question, sorry. I can ask a question if, if no one else has one. Um, yes, Brandon, please go ahead. I So I, I know probably a lot less about this than some other people in here, but um, I was just wondering, so you've got these different priors uh, for these geodynamo models. Is there, I mean, I suppose at some point you'd, you'd be interested in, in kind of working out which one of those is a more representative model. Um, is there any way of using this inversion process to predict some data that has not already gone into it and see how well that does? Or is it because you've used these geodynamo models, there's a lot of the data that you're going to be using will already be in those so you just can't do that uh, sort of a, a question because, yeah, kind so, of a validation approach. Yeah. Um, the the geodynamo models are constructed um, kind of completely differently from a field model would be constructed. So we have a dynamo model which is kind of simulating the Ford uh, model okay. of the yeah. physics, and currently we scale these with dimensionless parameters and we are not close to um, Earth-like parameters. So when I say we're moving along the path model, in theory, when we get to 100%, we are replicating Earth-like conditions. Um, that is if all of the assumptions that go into the physics hold true. So I think different people are always going to uh, have their favorite Dynamo model. And um, yeah, if we can use these to kind of like produce Earth-like or unearth-like flows to, like by using these different priors, then yes, maybe we could use them as a validation. But actually there's plenty of other ways that people uh, check that their Dynamo models are Earth-like. So whether they can replicate, replicate uh, polar wonder in the past and, um, I'm kind of straying up my <laughs> realm of expertise, um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I guess you know, uh, but for this application, maybe you'd want to find out which one makes the most sense to use for core flow. I guess, but yeah, makes sense. I think it's just important that we have um, we have like different considerations, like we're not a hundred percent sure of, um, so even comparing this S1 compared to Julian Albert's models. Um, so S1 is a completely different forcing than all of Julian Albert's models. Um, that's not to say that we know which forcing is correct. Um, it's so, um, mm -hmm. and again, you'd have to speak to either Julian on, or Nathaniel but different constructions have different positives and negatives, I guess, is so. Yeah, no, it makes, makes sense. It seems like that it's, it's, you've got sort of a few different theoretical choices, so it's, it's not necessarily so easy. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, uh, thanks. 
All right, thanks. Um, anybody else have a question? I'm aware that all of this is quite a, um, it's a kind of a thorough kind of like, we've plugged in lots of different possibilities and it's just kind of presenting like, this is what we get out at the moment. And I guess it's, it's interesting to see because there's not really that comparison in the community as far as I'm aware. Um, and again, we would love to test more. So, um, there's it, there needs to be some kind of documentation of this it's the not <laughs> um yeah <laughs> thanks i actually oh. have a quick hi kyle <laughs> hey i have a just a quick practical question uh how long does the system i mean how computationally expensive is this when you run you know you pick a certain prior and then you've done these runs from like 1900 up till the present um is this i mean is this a thing where you're it's pretty easy for you just to play around and now you know try a new prior every day or is this a thing where you're waiting you're waiting a, a week for your results i mean how big is the ensemble you're running and all that stuff so we're running an ensemble of 200 models um we're using um the diag and the key lasso which um isn't as computationally expensive as the dense pygeodine um, setup. Um, it depends completely on your time stepping and how long your period, your like your start date and end date is. Um, so my 1900 to 2000 results, I think I uh, forecast every year and I analyzed every five years and comparing that to the length of day data, I think we've not run it at a small enough time step. So we're gonna to have to go back and revisit that. Um, meanwhile, I ran the uh, 2000 to present data. I think I forecast every month and then I analyzed every three months, which is potentially at least for chaos, for instance, we don't have, um, we don't have uh, outputs from the model every three months. So we could potentially run that at a slightly longer time step um, and uh, reduce the computational time. But in general, um, it's about eight hours per run, roughly. Okay. So um, two to three runs a day, depending on uh, when you set them off and if it crashes. Um, but because we're trying to run it also with all of the parameters, like we're trying to fill up this kind of table of possibilities, it quickly adds up to uh, quite a lot of computation. So even though like one run might not take that long, it's the cumulative of, okay, now we're gonna test it with this slight tweak of parameters. So um, yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, I've been doing this sort of thing, but with full 3D dynamos, and then it's, um, you know, notice some of the sensitivity to parameter regime choices in the full dynamo model, but then it becomes, this, this is really cool because, of course, that becomes ridiculously yeah. expensive and stuff. So this is, uh, this, is, this is really neat. I guess this is what we want, is we want, um, we want dynamo models, and we want the kind of, like, statistics, but uh, again, we need, like, uh, a long enough time series and we need like a low enough Ekman number in order to extract those uh, temporal statistics that we need for the forecasting. So um, we are quite limited by the number of geodynamo models we can run um, through the Pygeodine uh, methodology at the moment, but hopefully that changes. And again, motivating for uh, dynamo people, please give us your dynamos. That would yeah, be yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the talk, by the way, really nice. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Hannah. I think uh, we don't have any questions for now. If you have any questions, I guess you can email Anna <laughs> more. <laughs> yep. So yeah, the, thanks again. Um, it was really uh, nice having you here.
to share the last slide. Um, so we have already for uh, filling up the 24 schedule. Oh no, it's gone. Uh, we start in February and we have slots. So if you want to give a seminar, please let us know. And all previous seminars are available on YouTube recorded. Uh, we have more than 100 presentations with you, so enjoy them. <laughs> and thanks again for coming. See you next year. <laughs>